All right, I think we're live. My red button hasn't hit yet, but oh, there it is. <laughs> there. I... Okay, good. I got my noise. I think we're live. Uh, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly. Go to patreon.com slash oxum or oxum.substack.com to subscribe. Today, our special guest is Officer Andy J. Welcome to the program. Hey there. It's good to be here. All right. So I remember you and I met about a year or two as we were involved mm -hmm. in this wonderful series um, held by the Orthodox Christian Leadership Institute. And the premise was addressing some of the concerns that were nationwide around racism. But I think really it was an opportunity or an opportune moment to um, get into scripture and and particularly Galatians. I'm, I'm just wondering before uh, that time, was that the first time you had ever encountered Galatians or had you grown up reading that particular text? Um, I think it was that particular opportunity was a uh, a good one for for really making a deep dive into the text. Um, so it's, uh, I, being a, uh, in a, a church family, I mean, my dad's an Orthodox priest, uh, I've, it's obviously a text that you've, uh, you've heard time and again, um, mm -hmm. but that was an opportunity where I had the, uh, the chance to, and the space, I think, to, uh, make a deeper dive into it. And it's a text that, uh, um, like the rest of scripture, the more you put in, the more you get out. Um, and, uh, so I think the, the opportunity was ripe for, for really trying to, to, uh, explore it. And that takes time. It takes energy. It takes work. And I think when you put all three of those in there, you, you're able to, to come up with something, you know, substantive from the text. Yes, and I, I would probably like to get a link in the bio, at least for the for the YouTube audience, so they can mm -hmm. go out and, and check your specific teaching on Galatians chapter 3. I think I had chapter 4, so we were kind of in, in sequence there. Yeah. Um, I remember chapter 3, my, that first kind of opening line is always mm -hmm. my favorite, the old foolish Galatians, who yeah. has bewitched you. Like uh, I've read it in a, in a few different languages and it just, mm -hmm. it sticks out to you all the different ways um, because it's, you're in one state where you are connected and on the right path and then you veer from the path. So mm -hmm. that kind of alert to come back. I, I always liked it. Was there anything in particular that stuck out to you or anything that you could remember about that, uh, that time or, or that text that, you would want to give people as a as a kind of uh, a bite <laughs> as a bite or... oh man um i remember going through it and thinking uh, how how critical the text is in that chapter but in the whole whole text really of uh of identifying tribe and and doing your best to dismantle tribe and that uh seemed very timely uh in 2020 and so it's uh uh, and that's a hard thing to do uh, because we, yeah. whether we like to, whether we acknowledge it or admit it or not, we all have our tribes. Yes. Um, and uh, I think in that specific moment, uh, there was a, uh, I guess people could say there was a duality between the police tribe and the uh, the Black Lives Matter tribe, um, but those bled into other uh, um, broader social identities too. But whatever you want to, whatever camp you want to, uh, say is yours uh that that text is is attacking your camp it's attacking the reader's camp um and uh that was that was a hard pill i guess for that year especially um mm -hmm. but really anytime you read that text if you're reading it seriously it's coming after um you and yours and that's uh that that's always going to be a difficult pill to swallow I, yeah, I love that. I have heard scripture in general referred to as the most self-scathing, self-critical text of all time, of its own tribe, of its own community. And it's funny because 
then it doesn't lend itself to be used as a bludgeon by one community against mm -hmm. another. But it also lends itself, like what they say, every heresy has been found in scripture because yeah. everybody kind of latches on to something that they think is in favor of their tribe to use mm -hmm. against another, as opposed to using it as a, you know, in the Orthodox Church, we often say like as a as a mirror to mm -hmm. reflect our own um, our own in, individually, but also better as a as a communal kind of sins and and burdens. I actually didn't know you were the son of an Orthodox priest. That's funny. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Um, so how is that? Um, were both you and your your father were then cradle in a like long line of that or was no, it, not uh, at all. No, yeah. I am. Um, Talk to so us my, about that. My dad grew up uh, Lutheran and um, my mom grew up Roman Catholic. And so when they met, uh, she became Lutheran. They were part of the ELCA um, for uh, a number of years. And then in 1995, uh, my dad was uh, one of a number of Lutheran ministers who kind of made the jump to uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. And so uh, at the time we were living in Unity, Wisconsin, population 400 people. So if you wow. don't know where it is, it's because nobody knows where it is. Um, <laughs> more cows within the uh you know the unincorporated limits and people wow. and uh we made the move to northeast minneapolis to uh saint mary's orthodox cathedral uh and so he became uh, one of the uh the priests there uh he was there for five years and then um he started a uh, mission church in anoka minnesota called christ the savior uh, orthodox church and was the priest there um for a decade or more i'm forgetting now um since then he's been at uh, holy trinity uh, orthodox church in saint paul minnesota and he is currently at holy Murbears in saint cloud minnesota which is about an hour outside of the uh, twin cities area and um so yeah exactly. I, I think i think there are actually a lot of uh, ethiopian manuscripts in saint cloud if i'm not mistaken is that where saint john's university is saint john's is in saint cloud um, okay okay yep so it's uh but there's you know they're hour from each other they're it's down the road it's there's obviously a strong connection um between the two um so he's uh yeah he's uh, an orthodox priest and uh so i uh, effectively i'm cradle in the sense that i was five when uh, we converted um but I, yeah, I was going to ask you that. That was, that's interesting. Yeah, so it, it's a hard question to answer because it, it's <laughs> when, when I think of cradle, I, I think of you know, there, there's obviously here the, the 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 tenets of orthodoxy that people adhere to, mm -hmm. um, but orthodox. I mean, those tenets are always kind of in the the stew of culture, and culture really uh, um, adds each particular as a as a certain flavor. Yeah. Uh, to, to the stew, you could say. Um, so the Greeks do their thing, the Antiochians do their thing. Um, and so I think that the a lot of the the culture and the flavor that, uh, you know, I kind of absorbed uh, through my parents, you know, had a, a a Lutheran flavor, which I'm I'm in the fishbowl, so it's hard for me to describe um, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's what I know and what I, you know, I, I can't say that I've known a whole lot of anything else. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting, you know, hopscotch story to get to, you know, where it, I am today. It, it is absolutely. And by the way, I went to a Lutheran middle school. So, hmm. uh, early there on for yeah. three years of my life, I attended Lutheran chapel every week because mm -hmm. every Wednesday we had chapel, uh, you know, I didn't go on Sundays, but mm -hmm. every, every week I, I grew up in that. So that was my largest being exposed to protestant christianity was, yeah. was my middle school actually i didn't know this at the time my preschool were born again born again evangelicals mm, <laughs> at, yeah. at preschool i had no idea but yeah. at the end you know uh my mom would tell me <laughs> she would come home and see my sentences and it's like every other line was about jesus and i had no mm. idea at the time so it's, yeah. it's funny that she told me that and they're orthodox christian but nominally like they didn't go to church or anything yeah. like that so 
it's not like they were mad about it, but they were just like, you guys kind of didn't tell us because it was kind of a secular school. Uh-huh. They, would, yeah. they would sneak in born again they lines. Pick up the flavor. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. funny that you said that you had this Lutheran flavor. It's also interesting that your mom converted from this higher church Catholicism, which Lutheranism as a project was pitted against, right? Yeah. Talking about tribe against tribe. Yeah. You know, Martin Luther kicks off the Protestant Reformation, and my mm-hmm. middle school made sure I knew that very well and all yeah. about the 95 theses. Yep. But uh, then you go <laughs> even older school. They do say that Luther may or may not have had some communications with the with the Eastern Orthodox and, yeah. and potentially even some Ethiopians. So it's mm-hmm. it, it's it's funny to, again to to come full circle. It's yeah. um, yeah, it's an it's an interesting tribe. So jurisdictionally, b- people in in my communion, the so called Oriental Orthodox, or I, yeah. I like calling it the Afro Asiatic, t- mm-hmm. typically view the kind of overall greek influence of everything because even the church in antioch is is the greek church of antioch as opposed to the syriac church there's like eight different jurisdictions in antioch Um, the greeks themselves are greek and then the russians were um, evangelized by the greeks as well so there's that kind of base greek but each one like you said has its own flavor Mm -hmm. Were, were you guys with mostly slavonic people in terms of culture mostly with greek people mostly with middle eastern people because there are kind of like as you mentioned different yeah even within the orthodox i i think we started out so saint mary's cathedral in northeast uh has a a large russian slav background and so that was kind of where we the part of the pool that we jumped into now having said that um what was going on at the time in the twin cities uh, there was a push to bring together some of the uh, the youth camps um, mm-hmm. because at the you know earlier on they were all separated the uh, the Russians had their camp and the Greeks had their camp and and those two primary denominations um, didn't really play with each other at all uh, and so the the mid 90s at that time there was a big push to bring those camps together. Uh, which you can imagine at, at first there was a lot of, uh, of friction and pushback uh, from both both the Russians uh, and the Greeks primarily because uh, uh, culturally they were so different from each other. Um, and my my dad tells these stories of when these camps came together, you have all these kids, you know, second, third grade, all the way to uh, high school seniors. And uh, the mannerisms that they had uh, soaked up in their youth were reflected and even how they they stood at church how they entered church um the 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 russian the kids with the russian experience um were always there early their heads were always down and it was very pin drop quiet and the greeks rolled in uh late you know several minutes late and and he said that they kind of they tended to treat the, the uh uh the church experience you know at this these camps is kind of an extension of their living room which was you know in a sense both good and bad for for various reasons and so these uh these cultures had to clash and one thing that um those camps are still together they formed one pan-orthodox camp That's and true. uh because of that there's been this uh this fusion between a lot of the uh um the orthodox churches in the metro area which i think is really beautiful because once you you know, once I leave the Twin Cities and I go to Chicago, I see like, oh, you know, people are kind of in their own camps again. They're not necessarily mm-hmm. talking to each other. Um, and there's something, there's something really beautiful about having this shared faith and the shared expression where where people can have friendships. Uh, there's been a ton of marriages that have come out of these uh, youth camps over time. Um, so it's it's a a fusion where where people have learned to enjoy and celebrate these cultural uh um nuances and flavors that each church kind of brings to the table while still keeping the bedrocks of what they adhere to that's right if if they don't have a sort of plan of repatriating back to their homeland it seems to be a necessity in north america with just the sheer lack of numbers we have to exactly like you say you know intermarry have Mm -hmm. everyone 
um, together and focused and more organized. I always talk to people about something I heard Bishop Callisto Ware say many years ago that mm -hmm. the fact that there are so many canonical jurisdictions claiming North America doesn't make sense in the first place because mm -hmm. the Orthodox Church was always the Orthodox Church in these various countries. It yeah. wasn't, you know, this church of this place. It was one church in different places. So now that we're in the same place, it it really is probably just pride and attachment to those tribes and you know not having a clear answer of you know who's going to be first amongst equals mm -hmm. in the in the uh, rearrangement and yeah. organization of that but you know it's supposed to be like one bishop per city and <laughs> everyone getting ordained by the same place and yeah. everything matching up but yeah it's um people might lose some of their precious idols and so that's uh, a dangerous thing for them did you did you ever see in these various communities or in the mixing of them any any approach to scripture being different or did you find it the the same i, I imagine five years old you're way too young to see a transition from from lutheran to the orthodox but i wonder amongst the orthodox i i didn't really see a i guess a, a paradigm or a perspective on these churches approach to scripture until you know my 20s and 30s um mm -hmm. I, I think that uh the joke with the orthodox is that uh um you know there, there's all these claims to being the uh, the one true faith and the faith of the desert fathers and everything and uh everybody's got a bible and nobody's really cracked it because you know it just uh nobody quite quite gets it you know gets there if if, if people if people think that they've they've won already, um, there's not a huge incentive uh, to really uh, grind into uh, the text. And that was true for myself too, because it, it's and maybe being a, a PK probably underlined that all the more for me. Where it's like I've, you know, why would I? We found we found orthodoxy. It's the one true faith, and. I'm I'm the priest kid too, so I've you know, I, I was probably in a position where uh, I didn't feel a need, maybe more than others even did, to really uh, really dive into what this text is. Um, and so I'm I'm thankful that you know as I've gotten older, I've I've realized the uh, the importance of it, uh, and I've realized how not only how counter countercultural uh scripture is but uh counter even counter human if that if that makes sense it, it's mm -hmm. it, it's uh resisting human desire almost on a on a biological plane even um or at least it's exposing that um and so it provides a, a lot of discomfort uh and so in one sense i i get why people don't read scripture. It's the same reason why people don't go to the gym, or you know, <laughs> it, it it it's difficult, and uh, you uh, it, it's a cold shower every morning. Like if you do it five or six times, like the seventh time still really sucks. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's I, I guess to to come back to the question: Did I hear or did I see any? nuances and how they people really receive scripture I, I think in my experience uh, a lot of the orthodox um there was kind of an, an unwritten assumption that uh, you know we're the one true faith and so we don't really need to to grind into this text um yeah yeah i think i think i have a similar experience i think the um sometimes it, it's the over mystification or sacramentalization yeah. of the liturgy as well but i think because and it, it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful mm -hmm. thing that the liturgy in addition to the smells and bells that attract the newcomers yeah. has a deep 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 amount of scripture within it sort of naturally yeah. preset through the lectionary or the schedule of readings yeah. and 
there's a sense in which it's great to to go through all those readings throughout the year just mm -hmm. by regularly attending church even if you are not good at reading or don't like reading yeah. and most of those societies were pre-literate yeah. you know uh, in ethiopia i've seen numbers as high as 90 percent illiteracy you know before the the communists took over in the 70s and, and went on their literacy campaigns yeah and with with that high illiteracy you still had, I think, a, a general intelligence of the population, which was powerful, that you could tell in their idiomatic expressions, which are lathered in the Bible, just like yeah. the English is lathered in the KJV. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from people hearing scripture. And sometimes, yeah. you know, our teacher, Father Paul, uh, Nadim Tarazi, mm -hmm. I would always say that he loves sometimes giving advice to people to just hear scripture as opposed to reading it because it kind of it takes a little bit of the control away from you when you've got the pages mm. of the book you could flip back and yeah. forth and you can still pause and, and do all this other stuff with audio tech we have today yeah but it 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 almost um uh, it almost puts scripture and control more when you have to hear it and the liturgy is kind of that area where you're read to by uh by the deacons so yeah i i see what you mean like they think they get enough of it through osmosis yeah um, so did you did you growing up in these communities uh participate in any sort of uh, peer bible studies or did you just learn at home with your dad and your family um there was a i went to a lot of church uh growing up and i think a lot of that was also kind of a a connection point to my dad so i I, I had two younger brothers and I think, you know, Saturday evening would roll around and we lived across the street from the church wow. and the uh, parish house. So, uh, um, you know, there was always, uh, if you, if you went to church, uh, there may be some chores you could get out of kind of thing. And so I thought, oh, I'll go to church. <laughs> um, and so I've, uh, um, I had a lot of time in church and just, you know, again th there's an osmosis uh part of this uh growing up um once i got to college i kind of bounced around with different uh um you know student groups that uh you know did some bible study here and there and again i i think everybody's intentions were good uh i think that everybody was starting from such a uh an infantile place myself included um of like how how do we read this text what are we trying to glean from it what's the context in which it's written what is it trying to communicate um and so the i got uh of some traction a little bit through college because i uh you know i uh met father mark bulos i met uh, dr richard bunton who happened to uh at the time be at uh the university of wisconsin at madison which is where i went to college mm -hmm. and uh, he and uh holly benton were kind of overseeing the ocf group then and so orthodox uh, christian oh, fellowship right yep and so i've uh that's that's really kind of where it it started is i'd, I'd go to these ocf meetings on thursday nights and uh you know there'd be sometimes just some hanging out but other times there'd be some some scriptural study and uh as i listened and as i inevitably sparred with rich on like what what certain things meant and i always lost but i like sparring nonetheless um <laughs> i'm sure the hebrew helps him <laughs> yeah uh that's uh yeah a little bit um i that really kind of uh started waking me up to the possibility that there's uh, a significant amount more that are in these pages than I you know I previously assumed um and so it kind of took off from there but up up until college uh it was you know for better or for worse just osmosis and again I, I'm not completely uh, discounting that because uh um there's a lot when you hear it over and over and over again, it's the repetition mm -hmm. that Father Paul talks about. Um, it's uh, I don't think it's completely for naught. I mean, it it still is forming those grooves in your brain, and so it uh, those words, even if they uh, didn't mean much when you heard them at ten, eleven, twelve years old, they circle back at twenty five and thirty, and you're like, oh, 
so you you have it it's this echo that's calling to you from the past it's kind of a cool thing yeah i i think so as well i i went to the orthodox church as a kid my parents didn't go so mm -hmm. my aunts and stuff would take me they baptized me but then they would never they would take mm -hmm. me for high holidays like two to three mm -hmm. times a year my parents and other outside of that and that was more like a you know as like a cultural festival yeah um, my aunts my two two of my aunts two of my dad's sisters took me to church more than anyone else yeah and they were both presidents at different times of our mm -hmm. our parish council yeah and um i remember even then we would arrive very late mm -hmm. <laughs> so i would just catch you know you, you say echoes you know we're, we're unique amongst the orthodox with our drums <laughs> i would catch mm. the echoes of the drums reverberating yeah. in me and and even years later like i would remember some of that stuff but i'm also i'm i'm certain and we had no bible study that yeah. i could uh recall at all yeah. but i'm certain there are people who must have said some things to me at that time that laid the foundation like i know in Amharic, when I was four, another one of my aunts, like, there's so many of my aunts, <laughs> the people who passed the faith to me, yeah. kind of like uh, Timothy in scripture gets it from his mom and his grandma, yeah. Lois and Eunice. Yeah. My, one of my, another, a third aunt actually taught me the Lord's Prayer in Amharic when I was four. Mm -hmm. So, and then that's said, you know, that's obviously from scripture. And then that's said a lot Yeah. while you're at church. So I'm, I'm sure those things, like you said, had a, laid the groundwork for you as opposed to someone you know who grew up buddhist or taoist or muslim or hindu or something you know radically different that would have to make a lot more steps than you would have had to make yeah there would be some heavier lifts i think um well and it's yes and no so to speak i think if for somebody who's making a, a dive into scripture uh, without having any orientation to it in some senses, I wonder if it's. I wonder if it's almost easier because there's less unpacking you have to do. Because uh, I, and there's one, uh, one thing in my experience that I've, I'm, I'm very aware of was the, the amount of scaffolding that you build with what you think scripture says versus what it actually says, mm -hmm. uh, and what, your. Uh, your tribe again your your orthodox tribe uh what they understand it to mean uh and so yes i have the same i, I have some of the vernacular in my head i have uh a lot of these these blueprints but i've been looking at them upside down kind of thing and so there's always a desire to be like no it's like this it's like no it's actually like this um so all of this to say that maybe maybe no matter what your experience it's gonna be a meat grinder so that's right and i think that's what's good about sending uh setting up and establishing genuinely intellectually diverse or people with different backgrounds which is what kind of brings us back full circle to how how we met it was a, a real conglomerate of people with with different backgrounds approaching the same text, yeah. which I think allowed us to to bring out different meanings of it. I mm -hmm. know from looking at some of the things people said in the early church, it's fascinating how there really is nothing new under the sun. People had some conversations about, you know, what occupations should Christians have or not have and they had these debates and arguments in the early church and then yeah. I think you don't hear them for a while and in that George Floyd moment of 2020 we begin mm -hmm. hearing people have these these tribal arguments the way yeah. that 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 you said that I'm I'm wondering um has it totally cooled off I I hear I, I'm not in Minnesota I'm in California yeah. but I I hear um people have had back and forth conversations and certainly uh, you know, don't don't say anything that you're not allowed to say. But yeah. <laughs> from uh, from your experiences, I wonder how you how you how um how you saw how people began to to view your occupation of of the law, which has this long, you know, venerable tradition and is honored by a lot of people. But I think uh, a larger and larger voice began 
to focus or highlight on the aspects of it that they found to be negative. But I, I wonder how you saw it, you know, then and, and now, you know, is it? Yeah, it's uh, so I, the good things are that the good news is that nothing's on fire right now, literally. Um, so the, the, I, I'm going to call that a win. Um, in terms of how are, are things settled? No, um, there's obviously this, this big explosion. And uh, like any other war movie that people have seen, there's the big bomb that goes off and people and then there's ringing in their ears and they're kind of stumbling around. And that's that's kind of, uh, at least in the Twin Cities area, that's that's how I'm perceiving uh, where things are are at. Um, now, I, I got into law enforcement in March of 2014, uh, which is notable because uh, that was before Ferguson uh, mm -hmm. happened. That was, uh, I believe, before Tamir Rice. That was before Philando Castile. Um, it was before uh, Jamar Clark. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, um, incidents that really um, brought the Twin Cities and maybe even the United States as a whole to a to a boil. Um, and so it's, uh, I feel like my my experience in law enforcement has been. Uh, a really unique one uh, because there's been a uh, um, an immense tension uh, that's been building, uh, and then it, it comes to this uh, this fire point uh, with George Floyd. Um, it's uh, it, it's not an easy intersection to be at because the uh, um, the loss of trust um is very tangible at least in the institution now uh scripturally the answer is easy it says like there, there's no faith in any institution so like why are you getting <laughs> about that? um and that's uh that was relieving to hear in the moment um because the 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 text was prepared for that question the text was prepared for this moment um even yeah, father paul would say you're not special in that exactly regard. Exactly, and so, and and even um, uh, as I experienced the the tension, it's that message that you're not special that says that uh, you know this may be uncomfortable for you and this may be dangerous for you, um, but it's more uncomfortable for somebody else. It's more dangerous for somebody else because uh, it, no matter what my experience is, I'm I'm driving around with a gun on my hip, um, and I've got people I can call. To bring more firepower, should I need it? Um, so I, the the fact that I'm in a position of power um, makes the experience of somebody who doesn't have that same authority and, and that same power more. Uh, it, it makes that the focus, um, and it's been relieving for me in a sense um, to just have that as an answer um, because I I focus less on what my experiences have been. And I focus more on on what I what I can do, um, but uh, yeah, it, it's been a a a, uh, a period of it's 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 still unsettled if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. There's still a lot of frayed edges, and people are still trying to uh, to make sense with that, um, even as uh, crime and gun violence uh has only risen in the twin cities um it, it's gotten much much more uh unstable in that sense um so uh yeah there's there's a lot packed into that question it's uh it's uh you know a, a, a big a big ball of wax it is and i i hope if if nothing else it sounds like since you started in early 2014, which is so fascinating that you said that because that's about the time that I was introduced to the Ephesus School. Mm. They had began with a blog and I was reading their blog. And then from there, whenever they started their podcast, it may have been February or something. So yeah. maybe a month apart from when you entered mm -hmm. law enforcement, I began listening to and studying scripture with people that would later connect us. So I, yeah. I find that to be a fascinating kind of... Absolutely. Uh, Something was in the water at the time. Uh, <laughs> God was waiting in the water. No, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so 
that time till now, as you've mentioned, there have been a lot of crescendos in the national conversations mm -hmm. in race, in policing, in security, yeah. in so many th of these things. And there have been so many different voices, right? The Some of the louder ones um, calling for abolition, the, the less loud ones, but maybe more prevalent for reformation and then mm -hmm. others for more more status quo uh, yeah. is 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 what is needed actually it's the reverse it's yeah it's um anyway th those are all these like different policy issues yeah without, without getting into that nitty-gritty mm -hmm. but but the point is people have had to think critically of these subjects and what i think i've seen is because of the tribalism there's a lack of shared meaning making when these crises or these crescendos of conflict are arising i'm wondering are you alone I, I doubt it but uh, are you alone you know like the prophet elijah felt in terms of wanting to use scripture as your meaning making me mechanism or when you engage with other law enforcement officers have do you meet or encounter any of them who are also grappling with or contending with with scripture to make meaning of of what's going on i think there are some people that I know who, uh, without having a basis in the text or without knowing the text uh, as they read it in front of them, are asking the scriptural questions. Um, and I think those are, are what is, uh, how does power fit into this? How does uh, tribe fit into this? Um, these are, are things that the, the text addresses and for you know a lot of folks um who who don't have that really um rigorous orientation to the text uh they're scratching at that message from a different angle if that makes sense um now having said that it's uh this is such an emotional intersection both for the police um and for the broader community as well mm -hmm. um and so it's whenever there's emotion, the uh, having that conversation, being being rigorous about what's in front of you, I think becomes harder because uh, with emotion, emotion uh, naturally turns your focus inward, and it turns it to your to your tribe, to your people, um, and I think it's it's hard for the police community in that sense uh, because there's such a strong tribe i mean we've we, we wear the same clothes we you know do the same job i mean it's just it's uh um you know when you're on the radio you don't say this is andy i'm gonna go do this thing or whatever it's no it, it's my number you know and they've got their <laughs> they've got their number um so there's a there's an emphasis on the collective on the team um and when that team feels attacked or threatened it's the most natural thing in the world for them like a body fighting off an infection to uh to turn that focus inward um now it, we know from reading the text and knowing the text that uh you know th this is not uh this is not the path um and so does the police community as a collective, do they know, have they realized that? Not yet. I don't know how or if they will. Um, does it make it a somewhat lonely experience? Yeah, I would say so. Um, but I think that whether, if we were talking about this completely outside of the, uh, the George Floyd context, if you were, you know, asking a banker pre 2007, 2008, you know, uh, how do I, bring scripture into my life i mean it, it yeah. would be as difficult for him in his context as it would be for me in my context uh yeah. again like there's uh especially uh, regarding the all the texts of usury in, in the text yeah. <laughs> yeah so there was uh no matter no matter who you are and what context you're in if you're going to take on scripture it's going to be a heavy lift um that you fail at repeatedly and that uh that wears you out and it's going to make you aware of how comfortable it it is to 
to lick your wounds, to, to, to focus more on, on yourself and on your tribe. Um, so the, uh, it ultimately is, is it lonely? Yes. But I think, I think following scripture is lonely. That's a lonely process. You know, it's unto death. So like, I mean, there, there's, there's no, uh, it, it's not the yellow brick road, no matter who you are. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we're not in Oz. Um, so how about when you are talking with people outside of the law enforcement community, whether they be, you know, at your local church, or I don't know if you mm -hmm. have some sort of community engagement, like regular patrols or something mm -hmm. like that in, in those situations, or even if you if you were ever present at any of the protests, do you do you, do you like see any Christian leaders or like religious leaders or or people who who used religious language on the other side of of that tribe? And I'm wondering if if they ever engaged you any in any conversations or if you thought silently about how how they're thinking of or making meaning of of scripture or religion. Uh... I, well, I, the first point I think that anybody can anybody can use scripture, as we mentioned before, to uh, to uh, propone a, a certain stance on anything. And so, um, now did I see that for myself? Um, you know, where I work is is uh, kind of an outer ring from the Minneapolis St. Paul area, and so I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't see any immediate. Um, uh, you know, protest filling the streets. Now there was, you know, another incident, um, was it last year now, uh, where a, uh, a woman, you know, mistook her, uh, an officer mistook her, um, gun for a taser and ended up, uh, shooting and killing this guy in a traffic stop. Um, now there was follow up from that. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was an encounter with protesters. Um, usually it, if people are gathering in the streets, uh, it, it's not an opportunity for conversation. <laughs> um, it's, uh, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Um, are there people who, who just, as I encountered, um, who used uh, scripture or referenced scripture? Um, yeah, I can't, I'm, I can't remember exactly where I've seen that. Maybe it's just part of the, you know, the online atmosphere that we all are are part of um but uh it, those were more more opportunities for people to to vent and express anger and frustration and all this stuff and i'm not saying that those aren't scriptural moments because they certainly are um but uh i i think uh those exchanges devolved into tribe uh exchanges and so they uh they had a sense of uh of uh coldness and hostility and uh there, there wasn't wasn't room for conversation um i think any real meaningful conversations from those come in the weeks and months and years that follow mm -hmm. um so like the, the twin cities is nowhere near digesting uh george floyd and what followed from george floyd um in in five ten years we might be able to to have a uh, a conversation but you know the, the towers have fallen and there's dust everywhere and people are still running around you know going crazy so it, it's going to be some time before people can really uh digest those constructive that's so interesting i didn't realize it was too soon it's like um it's almost it's a cliche for people to say something is is too soon but then there are those genuine moments where the emotions are still flared. Well, it's you know exchanges like those really uh, they hack into a long memory. Um, I mean, even just the the relationship to American policing uh, in the African American community in this country. Um, like there, there's conversations about it now, but nobody's saying, "All right, all done." You know, good thing that's all behind us, and it's like. I think anybody who's honest is still realizing that there's more to unpack from those. Um, there's a lot, uh, a lot that still has to be uh, digested and, and synthesized. Um, so it's uh, it 
it's going to take time. I mean, I've, I've, I've been on, on, I'm somebody who knows the importance of traffic stops of doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, traffic stops and, and making those routine stops and finding bigger, bigger things as you, as you do those. Um, and I've also been the cop that stops somebody who's black and I can just see the terror they're shaking. Um, and I, stopped them because their, their tabs were expired i mean it was just it it's something they gotta you know be aware of um but uh for that woman i remember it very clearly there's a a whole narrative of what that stop means to her um of what could happen to her um and it's it's all just coming right to the surface at that moment and for me it was I don't know, it was over in four minutes, and then I was back on Facebook on my phone, just doing whatever. And, you know, for her, it it had this, that exchange had such a a long memory that preceded it. And so um, you don't dig out of holes like that overnight. And so the same with with uh, George Floyd and the Twin Cities, like, we got a long way to go before we can really make sense of this, you know. Well, this is this has been um, a beautiful discussion that that I think people should have more of, and I've appreciated. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Officer Andy. Is there something in closing, in terms of remarks or thoughts, your two cents that you can give, so that these these longer histories of anxieties don't fully you know conquer and trap the way that we're talking with one another engaging with one another when we see each other and um is is there a, a tribe shedding way in which you can give advice both side people in law enforcement and outside on like how can how can we slowly unravel some of those of those things you read scripture and, and you engage with your neighbor and you do those repeatedly and it's it, you make it a practice that seeps into your bones and you will realize that hopefully you're you you can't rid yourself of your tribe that's just it's in your it's in your dna it's who you are but you can expand your tribe i think and if we expand our tribes then maybe there's some hope I like that. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Deacon.